Okay, so freezing fruit and vegetables. It's easy. That's the most simple way I can put it for you all. It is easy. It's time. Your time is not going to be wasted, especially, I'm not going to say we waste time when we're canning, but it takes a lot of time. And whenever we're freezing them, we save some of that time. So instead of slaving over that stove, sweating literally in this summer heat, you won't get the chance to do that. I'm sure that really disappoints a lot of you that you won't be able to sweat over that stove while you're canning and you get the actual breeze and mist from the freezer from freezing things. Sorry to disappoint you, but it's super easy. And here are just some things that I want you all to keep in mind when you are freezing. And this is just things that there are actually questions that you get a lot, but it's something that you really want to keep in mind. Freezing slows the growth of microbial organisms. That's why we do it, because we're slowing that growth so we can preserve the fruit. Cherries and berries are best frozen following their harvest. However, whenever you're dealing with firmer fruit like your apples and your peaches, you may need them to ripen some more because they tend to be too firm. You wanna freeze your fruit in a form of intended use. So if you want to cube up some mangoes perhaps, which are absolutely delicious, cube them up. Do not freeze the entire mango and assume that, oh, when I thaw these out, I'll be able to use them. Cut them up, no. That's not realistic, so the best thing for you to do is to actually freeze them the way you intend to use them. And most fruit maintain high quality for eight to 12 months, and that's only at that highest quality when it's frozen at zero degrees or lower. And the high quality in your citrus fruits, even your juices, it's not gonna be the eight, um, to 12 months is gonna be four to six months. And you still want the freezer to be zero degrees and lower. So when you're cleaning your fruit, do not over soak them. And I know if you're anything like me, I have a tendency to do that sometimes because I wanna make sure I clean them as thoroughly as possible. And I tend to use vinegar and water when I'm cleaning my fruit. And if you leave your fruit in that vinegar and water solution too long, they're going to get pretty soggy and you're going to lose that quality that you're trying to preserve from the jump and nutrients. So selecting freezing containers. This is just as important as choosing the fruit that you're going to preserve. So you want to choose containers that are moisture and vapor proof and moisture or moisture and vapor resistant. Now, what's the difference, you may ask? So when it's proof, that's when you're dealing with rigid containers. That's when you have your glass containers, a metal container, or even those thick plastic containers. They're the best option when you're trying to preserve the quality of your frozen fruit. Now, when you're dealing with the moisture and vapor resistant, those are the things we tend to use the most, like those plastic bags. Those would be resistant. They're not proof, but they will resist the freezing and maintain the quality of your fruit. Now, carton containers, you wanna stay away from those. And when I say carton containers, I'm talking about milk or a cheese, your dairy products that we're buying in the cartons. Now, when we get those, it's best to freeze them no longer than two weeks, because if it goes over two weeks, you really start to use the, lose the quality of your product. The shape and size of the storage container. This is so important because how often do we stack things in our freezer and we go to get it but we get extremely discouraged because it's packed under how many other bags or how many other containers. So 
make sure you're getting, you're using containers that will be easily accessible and that you will be able to identify your products in. And now we're moving to the preparation of the fruit. So you're going to choose fruit that you would eat. You're not going to get anything that's not ripe unless that's what you're going for. But most of the time, we're choosing fruit that we want to eat because when we thaw it out, that's exactly what we're going to get. If it's an overripe fruit, when you freeze it, when you thaw it out, guess what? It's going to be an overripe fruit as well. So you want to rinse and drain with care because, again, you don't want to oversoak them. And secondly, you don't want them to fall apart because if you're using something like blackberries or blueberries, if you're too rough with them, you'll crush them and you're losing the fruit that you worked so hard to pick and that you're working so hard to preserve. So prepare fruit as they will be served or used, as I stated earlier. If you want it cubed up, diced up, that's how you should prepare it. And do it, don't do it way ahead of time. You wanna do everything within a two hour period. Everything from the rinsing to the, the making sure that you're draining them and storing them. You wanna do that within a two hour period. Prepare fruit again as they'll be served or used and do not over prepare too many fruit at once because as I stated, you wanna do everything within a two hour period because if let's just say that I'm planning to freeze a gallon worth of blueberries and I know I won't have time to freeze but half a gallon of them. Now, if I clean all of them and drain them all, when I finally get back to them, they'll have lost some of their quality. They'll have lost some of those juices which has some of those vitamins and nutrients that I'm trying to preserve. So don't do too many at once. Do exactly or try to pinpoint exactly how many fruit you plan to put up. That's how many you're going to prepare. And avoid using galvanized materials. And that's like those metal spoons or containers that have zinc in them. Because once Sometimes that acid in the fruit will break down the material and you can be poisoned and no one has time for that. So let's just avoid using those materials. So moving on to anti-darkening agents. As you can see, we have four total. We have the azorbic acid, azorbic acid mixtures, citric acid and lemon juice, and steaming. Honestly, steaming. Who would think to steam fruit prior to freezing them? Unless you're used to baking a lot of apple pies. I can see that. But other than that, that's not really something that my family did or that they do even now. So adsorbic acid, this is the one that tends to be the most popular and that's nothing but vitamin C. And you're using this because it's going to preserve your color. And since it's vitamin C, you have that nutritive, fat, nutritive factor also. And you're going to, when you're using it, you're gonna add your crystal powder to a small amount of water, the least amount possible. And you're going to slowly stir it up. Because if you stir it too quickly, you'll have air bubbles and you don't want those problems. So after you stir it up, then you'll add it to your syrup or directly to your fruit. And that leads us to adsorbic acid mixtures. Now this is adsorbic acid with an additive, and that can either be sugar or sugar and citric acid. And when you're using anything like this, follow the directions. Don't think, ah, oh, this sounds like it might be right, but I want to add just an extra teaspoon or tablespoon. Please don't. Just follow the directions, okay? And make sure you're not adding too little or too much because if it's too little, it's not going to preserve your fruit the way you're intending it to be preserved. If you add too much, 
it can cause a problem with the flavors. And that's the whole point for preserving, right? So that we get to maintain the flavor. So now we're moving on to the citric acid and lemon juice. Citric acid nor lemon juice is effective enough to even be compared with absorbent acid, okay? However, it can be used on some fruit, but it's nowhere near as effective as using adsorbic acid. And you're gonna dissolve the content in cold water. As you can see, that is the same method when you're just using absorbic acid. So when you're using your citric acid or your lemon juice, you're going to add the contents to cold water. And you're gonna submerge your fruit in there just for one to two minutes because you're not gonna leave it soaking. You're going to drain it off, okay? And then you're going to package it. So now we're moving on to steaming. And as I, I stated apples earlier, because that's one that you typically see being steamed. So you're gonna steam these to prevent the darkening. And you're gonna do it with a single layer around one and a half inch, um, one and a half to two minutes. And then you're gonna submerge it into some cool water. And the reason for this is to stop the cooking. If you don't submerge it in your cool water, it'll continue to cook and then it'll get too soft. And then you'll lose the quality of your, of your product. And we don't wanna do that because then that would be wasted time and wasted product. And that's a waste of money. All right, so we have several methods to pack our fruit. And we have the syrup pack, sugar pack, unsweetened pack and the tray pack. Now, with the syrup pack, this is whenever you're truly going to use this for dessert purposes, for the most part, it's going to be sweet because that's exactly what that syrup is, sugar and water. So you see a 30% syrup, which is one and three-fourths cup of sugar per four cups of water. And this is the recommended amount for most fruit. However, whenever you're using sour fruit or that mild tasting fruit, that's when you're gonna wanna change that amount. And I know that if I was using something that was really sour, I would definitely want a sweeter sugar, but it depends on what you're going for. And there are recommendations for the head space it's just like if you were canning, you wanna leave that head space. And especially when freezing because your food is going to expand. So you wanna make sure you're leaving enough room. And if you'll just note that you're gonna leave at least half an inch of head space for wide top pints, three fourth inch for narrow top pints, one and one half inch for narrow top quarts, and when packing juice, you're going to leave a head space there as well. And I know sometimes we, we get so ahead of ourselves and we get in that groove and we're moving so swiftly that we can neglect to leave that head space. But take your time doing this. It's super easy. You're already saving time so that you will not skip that step of leaving head space. Because again, if your food needs room to expand, it's imperative that you leave that head space or you'll have a ruined product. And again, if you have a ruined product, that's wasted time and wasted money. Okay, so now we're going to the sugar pack. This is less work because you're literally, it's just sugar. So you're gonna add one part sugar for three parts of the fruit. And you'll put that in a bowl, a large mixing bowl, and then you will stir it up. Make sure you coat your fruit thoroughly, very well, until the sugar starts to dissolve and you have the natural juices. Because what's nice about that is you can store your fruit in the natural juices if they produce it during that stirring process. And again, you're gonna leave that head space if you're planning just as though you were packing their pack fruit, you're gonna leave that same amount of headspace. All right, so for those who are healthier, we have the unsweetened pack. 
and this is no sugar added. Sometimes the fruit are packed in water or in its natural juices. And you can also add some adsorbic acid to prevent or to retain that color. All right, so next is the tray pack. And this one tends to be extremely convenient, especially if you like making smoothies or putting those berries in your pancakes and waffles. So what you wanna do is take whole fruit. Let's say we're using blueberries or strawberries, but I wouldn't really recommend freezing your strawberries, but definitely your blueberries. So you're gonna spread those out on a single layer and you're gonna put those in a freezer. And once they're frozen, you're just gonna take them out and you have frozen individual fruit. And you'll place those into your container. And in my family, we just tend to use a Ziploc bag, one of those freezer bags. So it's easily accessible on the door. I'm telling you, you have to have an action plan because if you don't, you'll never find those things. <laughs> my grandmother, God rest her soul, her freezer was packed. If she sent me to go get something, 30 minutes later, I think I found it. <laughs> okay, so I've been talking about the sugar syrups. So here are the recipes. There are even calories that are detailed here. And if you would like a copy of this, just send me an email and I'll put that in a chat box for you later so that you can shoot me an email for any of this information, anything that you need, whether it be recipes, I have a wonderful recipe book, just let me know and I would love to provide you information. So we have from very light syrup to the very heavy syrups, and it has to be something that's extremely tart, sour, for you to use that very heavy syrup. That's a lot of sugar, a lot of sugar. All right, so now we're gonna go to our keep in minds, the quality of frozen vegetables. Uh -oh. oh, I believe we're moving on to our frozen vegetable segment. I'm sorry. So this is gonna be very similar to our frozen fruit. So our keep in minds, are going to resemble those a lot. So the quality of your frozen vegetable is gonna be based on the quality of the fresh produce, just like the frozen fruit. If your frozen fruit, if it's bad in its fresh state, it's gonna be bad when it thaws out. So you wanna make sure that your vegetables are fresh and it's something that you would actually eat. So with the exception of bell pepper and herbs, Blanching followed by instant cooling is vital when freezing vegetables. There are, of course, a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, you want to blanch them. And as stated earlier, whenever you're steaming your fruit, you want to submerge them into cold water to stop that cooking process. The same principle applies here in blanching. So for a dry pack and tray pack, are the recommended basic methods for freezing vegetables. And it's super easy. It's just like what we just went over with the frozen fruit. I'm sure you're like, this is too simple. It's too good to be true. It is true. It is this good because it is this simple. You can even get your kids to help you or your grandkids. So frozen vegetables, they maintain their quality for 12 to 18 months. How nice is that? And that's longer than the fruit. Remember, the fruit remained their optimum quality for 8 to 12 months, whereas here we have frozen vegetables for 12 to 18 months. So when preparing our vegetables, if possible, you want to harvest vegetables in the morning while it's cool and store them within two hours. And Christian and I actually had an opportunity to discuss this um, concerning harvesting the vegetables in the morning. Would you like to touch on that some, Christian? Well, sure, I, I just needed to unmute myself. So 
you know, ideally, you know, of course, this time of year when we're out harvesting our vegetables, we want to do that in the morning for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because it is really hot and getting out and working in the garden when it's really hot is not the most pleasant thing in the world. Uh, so getting out there in the morning is going to be good. But uh, the, uh, you know, the cool temperatures are going to mean that most of your vegetables are going to have more water content early in the morning than they would later in the day. Uh, and that can improve your, your vegetable quality a little bit uh, and certainly you know, improve their, their storage and, uh, and how you're going to be able to take care of them. Uh, so harvesting in the morning, uh, they've been at cooler temperatures, they've been able to absorb that water, they haven't lost a lot of that water through uh, transpiration. Uh, so you'll have that higher water content uh, and that way you can, uh, you can sort of improve the quality that way. There you go. Great. Thank you so much. All right, so now that we have harvested our wonderful vegetables, we're going to wash them in cool water. And sometimes we have a tendency, have a tendency of picking our vegetables and picking soil up with it. So sometimes one rinse is not enough. I would hate for you to start preserving your vegetables and you notice dirt in them. And no one wants those problems, especially when you're eating it and you get a little grit. That is not a pleasant experience. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. So you wanna make sure you're washing your vegetables in cool water and repeat if necessary. So you're gonna separate your vegetables by size and identify which will be suitable for freezing because you do not want to use certain vegetables for freezing. You want to use some of them for canning. And we'll touch on that next. All right, so blanching. So boiling water blanching. And this is, I touched on it briefly with things you want to keep in mind. You're going to bring one gallon of water to a bowl. And then again, you're going to submerge one pound at a time of your vegetables and you're gonna cover them for the recommended time, not for what you think that time should be or what your grandma thought that time should be, but what the recipe tells you that time should be. Then you're gonna, with steam blanching, this is similar to uh, what we discussed earlier with the fruit. You're gonna place a rack or a basket into a pot and then it should be at least three inches from the bottom. Put one to two inches of water in the pot and bring it to a boil. And then you're gonna place your vegetables on that rack so that they can begin steaming. You don't want to over place to overfill your rack because if you do, then some areas will not steam as quickly as others. You want the steam process to be even. You don't want some to be overcooked and others to be undercooked. You want it to be an even process. That way your product is better. And once blanching process is over, you're going to immediately place vegetables into cold water. Ice water would be best because you're stopping that cooking process as quickly as possible. All right, so ways to pack. Very similar to what we went over in the fruit process, you have the dry pack and the tray pack. So again, with that dry pack, you're gonna place blanched and drained vegetables into their containers of choice. And remember, we are being very cognizant about which containers we are using because we wanna have enough room to store other packages or other containers later on. You're gonna pack tightly into that container that you're using cutting down on the amount of air that's in there because we don't want freezer burnt product. That I'm telling you, we, you have to really think about these things because nothing is worse than following all of those directions and then where you go into the freezer to remove your product because you really had a taste for some of that broccoli and it's freezer burnt. And you've wasted your money, you wasted your time and we do not want to do that. So. Let's make sure we're getting as much air as we can out of the package. And again, headspace is important. You wanna leave a half an inch of headspace at the top of rigid containers. 
and then you're going to close them securely. And for freezer bags, this is a great technique because sometimes we'll just fold it over and try to get that air out. But if we not only fold it over to get the air out, if we twist and fold the top of the bag and then tie it, either with one of those, the kind that you usually see on the bread pack, or you could even use a rubber band. That's a great way to preserve it and to ensure your quality even for an even longer period of time. And if you'll note that here I have some foods um, for headspace is not exactly necessary, and that's your broccoli, your asparagus, and your Brussels sprouts. You don't have to pack those as tightly in your containers, thankfully. Can you imagine trying to truly, truly pack Brussels sprouts tightly in a container? It'd be lumps all over that container. <laughs> okay, so now we're moving on to the tray pack. So place chilled, well-drained vegetables in a single layer, just as we would with that fruit. And once it's frozen, we're going to remove it from the freezer and immediately pack it, whether you're using a freezer bag or one of those rigid containers, you're gonna, gonna immediately pack it so that it retains its frozen, it maintains its frozen state. And here are some references. And do we have any questions concerning 